Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Michelle Miao, a member of the Board of Governors for the Commonwealth Club of California and also host and producer of the Michelle Miao Show. Tonight's program is one of over 500 program, uh, programs the club produces annually. While the club did pivot to an all virtual platform during the pandemic, we are extremely excited and thrilled to welcome you back to the club for live in person events. For more information about upcoming events or to listen to a past podcast or even to learn more about how you can support the work of the club, head to commonwealthclub.org. If you'd like to participate in tonight's conversation, you can do so if you're joining us live on YouTube by sending us your questions in the chat box and we'll try to get them to our panelists and our moderator. Tonight's conversation is focused on President Biden's promise during the 2020 campaign trail to appoint a black woman to the Supreme Court Justice. And now we've got interest in this conversation after the announcement of Justice Stephen Breyer's retirement. And so we're excited to have everyone here to discuss this very, very point, this promise. Let's see if it's made. And so to moderate this discussion, I'm very deeply honored to introduce to you my good friend and also colleague, Carolyn Weisinger, who's the Education Coordinator for the Commonwealth Club of California and also Board President of San Francisco Pride. Carolyn. Thank you so much, Michelle. And I'm just so excited to have this amazing group of women and talk about this very important topic. And, and I wanna jump right into it because I personally have had quite a day you know, with getting people to understand how important this moment is specifically to Black women, why I as a Black woman should be the one that's moderating this, because it's a conversation that we have in our, our Black women circles so much and so often. And, and I'm going to start off jumping to you, Jateka, because you and I met, you, I, and Amy actually met as we were working on what was then called the Keep the Seat campaign, which was after our amazing Vice President Kamala Harris was actually um, elected as Vice President of the United States, and we really wanted to keep a Black woman in her U.S. Senate seat. Um, unfortunately, we weren't successful in that, but it really generated a lot of energy and conversation at that time. But my question to you as the founder of Win With Black Women, why do we still have to fight for this one little seat at these tables? We got to fight to keep the seat. We got to fight to keep our sisters out of these recalls. Stacey Abrams had to fight and eventually lost in, in her gubernatorial race. Why do we have to keep fighting like this specifically as Black women? Well, first of all, thank you, Carolyn, and thank you to the Commonwealth Club for just having this important conversation. It's just really an honor to be on this panel with such distinguished voices and Black women who have been a part of so much of the fabric of America. Uh, your question is a very important question. I think, number one, because representation matters. It matters uh, who is elected into office and who is representing because the lived experience of all Americans and particularly that of Black women is particularly very important, particularly in places of power as it relates to the United States Senate and to the U United States Supreme Court. And we all know the statistics for more than 233 years. The U.S. Supreme Court has been void of the lived experience of a Black woman. It is not because there has not been a qualified Black woman who has been poised and ready to take her rightful place, her rightful seat, as you asked in the question, on the U.S. Supreme Court. But it has been because there has been an, a lack of representation and a lack of will uh, to put forth a Black woman to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, I think that now is our time, and I am just elated that President Joe Biden made the promise and that he is going to commit to keeping that promise. And I'm looking forward uh, to the day that he stands before the nation and presents to the nation what we know will be a qualified uh, nominee to the Supreme Court who will also be the nation's first Black woman to the U.S. Supreme Court. And again, what I would just reiterate 
um, is that what we know that this woman will bring to the court is not only her qualifications and just her legal expertise, but also uh, weaving in what she will represent in the lived experience of a Black woman to the nation's highest court, uh, which covers and which convenes to make decisions on issues that impact our day-to-day -day lives, whether it is voting rights or our reproductive choice and other issues in between. Well, then set against that, let's go back in, in history just a little bit. You know, in, in 1971, Polly Murray um, wrote President Nixon and did, as she said, something which may be unprecedented in the history of the United States to directly apply as a self-identified Negro woman for the seat on the, superior, on the Supreme Court. And remember, Polly Murray was one of the most influential non-credited constitutional lawyers of our time. Thurgood Marshall himself actually credited her work and her writing for his landmark um, separate, separate versus equal um, race or fight. So I want to ask LaDoris, because I, I'm reading your book. I haven't finished it yet, Judge. I just want to say that. But it, it has so much information and so many um, ideas and thoughts about your time on the bench. You know, how deflating is that to us as Black women and our um, how we feel about the justice system, knowing that we're always so influential in, in these cases in the justice system, but we had to wait 50 years from her applying to actually see this moment? Right. Uh, I, I do want to just pick up on the Polly Murray comment you made. She was an amazing woman. There's a documentary about her on Netflix, but in, in my book, uh, Her Honor, uh, there's in the very front is an epigraph and an epigraph is just a quote from someone who embodies the spirit of the book. And the quote I chose was one from Polly Murray. So people who don't know her, I hope you will get to know her because she's just been so overlooked through history. So to, to get to, to your point, I, what, what has struck me so much is that it's been 31 years since a black woman sat before the Senate Judiciary Committee ahead of a Supreme Court justice nomination hearing. And that black woman was Anita Hill. She appeared before that committee on live television. She testified against justice to be Clarence Thomas. Um, and it was Joe Biden, who was a Senator at the time who chaired that committee. And that committee was composed of a group of 14 white men who went on to recommend the confirmation of Clarence Thomas to the Supreme Court. So I look at the irony of this, 31 years later, we now have a black woman who will be sitting in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee, this time seeking an appointment to the US Supreme Court. Uh, and, and you know, one of my fantasies was, wouldn't it be just something if it were in fact, Anita Hill, who was recommended for the appointment and here we have Joe Biden as president, but he could make amends for all of that, but it's not gonna happen. Uh, we want someone, young enough to serve for a long time. And I hope, by the way, it's someone who reflects the philosophy, the sense of a black community, because that's not what Clarence Thomas is at all. He is not in tune with the views of the black community. And so why is it important? Why am I excited about it? The US Supreme Court works by having consensus. They have conference meetings where they talk about whatever cases they've decided to hear. And these are cases that whatever they rule on affects everyone in the country. And I, I find it so really interesting because at these conference meetings, they talk about it and they bring in their own experiences. We have not had a black woman there to bring in her own experiences. It's so important to do it. And I just wanna bring up one last thing. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, when she was on the bench, she talked about how she learned from Justice Thurgood Marshall. And th this is a quote from her. Uh, she, she said this or wrote this, occasionally at conference meetings, I still catch myself looking expectantly for his raised brow and his twinkling eye, talking about Thurgood Marshall, hoping to hear just once more another story that would by and by perhaps change the way I see the world. That's the importance of having inclusion representational diversity on the U.S. Supreme Court. 
And, and I certainly apologize, Judge, because for those who don't know who Judge LaDoris Cordell is, she is the first African-American woman judge in the state of California. And I am just so honored. In Northern California. Northern, Northern. California. I'm sorry. Thank you for correcting me. I don't want to offend anybody else. And, and we're actually going to get the district attorney back in just a little bit, who is the first black woman district yeah. attorney in my, my county of Contra Costa County. And I, I adore her so much. You know, so let's get to the promise then. So in, in 2020, during a presidential debate, President Biden made a pledge that he was going to nominate a Black woman to the Supreme Court under a, a bit of almost duress. It was just before he was going to South Carolina looking for um, the approval of the, the state with one of the highest Black populations in the nation. And so for some of us who may be a little bit ambivalent, um, it felt like he was just trying to make a play to get more Black voters. And so now he is at a moment where he can actually make good on that promise. And I wanna kind of bring up a quote as, as I'm pivoting over to you, um, Amy Allison from She the People, a quote from Kim Tignor from She Will Rise, um, who said that Biden's statement is the first step in renewing the trust of black communities in, dem in, in a democracy that is in grave danger. So having said that, you know, what does this mean in, in terms of in terms of doing that? How will this rehabilitate black women's feeling about democracy? And what is what is a downfall if it didn't happen? There are those of us who said maybe he won't fulfill this promise. It was just something to do to get elected. So what are what are the things that are at play in that context? It's a promise that's never been made to black women. Uh, you know, when Polly Murray was, uh, you know, back in the, in the 70s, proposing to sit on the bench, black women were only guaranteed the right to vote for about six, seven years. And imagine now uh, we are in a position where the president can make a, or the, the nominee for president can make a promise to a group of people who have been in the forefront, highest vote turnout, uh, most savvy and effective organizers building uh, multiracial coalitions, changing the landscape of places in the South and the Southwest, um, even here in California that had been uh, written off as red or uh, that, that, that Black, kind of a, a myth that Black uh, people don't participate uh, fully in civic life and really rewriting the story of American politics. And we're in a position now um, after having uh, the Harris, you know, the Biden-Harris administration in place for a year to have this tremendous opportunity. It's an opportunity not just for Black women. It's an opportunity for America. It's at this time, as you uh, so uh, rightly said, Carolyn, that the forces, the anti-democratic forces are stronger than ever. People are uh, you know, protesting, talking about race at all in history classes and, and uh, proposing banning uh, books. I mean, these are retrogressive forces that are alive and well, and they would love nothing more than to silence us. And you have this group of, uh, of women who are being considered and currently vetted for, you know, this uh, process, this nomination process to the highest court you know, and these are constitutional experts. These are experienced jurists. These are impeccable women with impeccable credentials and integrity who happen to represent uh, these people, those of us who are black women in this country who are leading the, um, the, the, the idea and the implementation of justice. And, you know, we're gonna have an opportunity over the next few months during the, um, the uh, nomination process to actually talk about the uh, in amazing uh, opportunity this is for the country to actually have a person on the court who represents a majority of uh, black women who are um, justice minded uh, at large and who are leading the pro-democracy efforts in the country. So I'm excited about it. I think what, what we need to do is to really think about what is it that we're gonna need to do to make sure that the country focuses on the qualifications, on the credentials, on the integrity. It's something after living four years under Trump and it's something that we look at what's going on day to day that we need desperately. And that's the opportunity that we have, um, a black woman bringing that to the entire country. Okay, so I'm gonna start getting into some questions and I really, really hope that my civics teacher from high school is not listening because I need everyone on here, all y'all expensive or, or, or expensive law people to explain some things to me. And I'm, I'm gonna start with, with my district attorney, Dinah Beckton. <laughs> because, you know, 
you we, we you assume and it, it may seem more comfortable for justice to live outside of electoral politics and politics in general but being a district attorney you are actually someone who's been on the bench who is a lawyer and who is elected to your position can you talk a little bit about how how it is doing justice work under that intense political scrutiny we're seeing we have a what a handful of black da's across the country who always get a lot more scrutiny for their their lens the way that they um, rule in certain things how can how do you rule under that or how do you make those type of decisions under that scrutiny well, you know, it's going to be a very interesting position um, that's going to happen when we have eventually have this nomination. And as has already been pointed out, um, all of those who are being considered are amazing women, amazing constitutional scholars who have impeccable credentials. And so when they come to this table, they will come prepared with not only their experience, and their knowledge, but you know they've probably had to fight a lot of battles and break a lot of ceilings to get to the point where they are. I did want to just mention that the fact I'm really excited about the fact that we're having this conversation, this important conversation during Black History Month, because as we know, uh, as has been said so many different times, there is no American history without Black history, because our Black history is American history. And I think the other thing that's going to happen as we begin these conversations over the next few months is that Black women will have who, who have an incredible history in the legal profession, well, there will be an opportunity to lift up our stories and the importance important roles that we have played in these spaces. Now, you've hit on something that I think is also important because uh, just as you've mentioned, uh, many, all of us probably here on this panel are, have been a first someplace. You know, you mentioned um, um, Judge um, Cordell, who's just one of my sheroes, uh, who I've absolutely looked up to over the years. When I became a Superior Court judge in Contra Costa County, I was again the first, uh, the first Black woman to be um, elected as the presiding judge. And now I find myself in this position, along with just a handful of other women around the country, to be the first um, woman, the first Black woman, uh, and the first person of color, all of that, to serve as the district attorney in Contra Costa County in its 168-year history, which literally takes us all the way back to slavery. And in this space, um, my counterparts around the country, um, we are um, when you look at all of the, the elected prosecutors in the country, we are about 1% uh, women of color are 1% in this profession. And so I think what we will find is what so many of us have found when we have broken through these very, very thick uh, glass ceilings, uh, we know for sure it will happen because it has happened to each and every one of us as we have broken this ceiling. It's already happened. There will be opposition to our, our, our nominees. And I just, I'm gonna just put that out here on the table. It's already happened. We're going, we have seen and we have lived this story too many times. What happens is when uh, women of color, black women get into these positions, people immediately want to challenge our right to be here as if we have no right and as if we have no qualifications to sit at this table. And so I think as black women, uh, as part of this conversation, in addition to what's already been stated, we must be prepared with facts and information about these beautiful, intelligent women who are going to come forward so that when they encounter opposition, we are here to tell their amazing, amazing stories. They're going to say things like, oh, well, she's only getting it because she's an affirmative action candidate or uh, she's getting this job because she's a Black woman. And they're going to do everything that they can to discredit her and to discredit her abilities how do I know this? Because it has happened to me and so many other Black women around the country. Uh, as Black women leaders, we're not going to be surprised as uh, when our credentials are attacked because we are entering into a place that has historically been a white male space. 
We know that these tactics have been over and over, used over and over again to diminish Black women and to diminish our accomplishments. So that's what I'm going to urge all of us to be thinking about as we have time to prepare and move into this important, important space of the nomination process that we begin to think about how, no matter who that nominee is, that how we lift up the important and amazing accomplishments so that when those critics come, we will be standing by her side in front of her, behind her, on the side of her, pushing her, letting her know, yes, you are entitled to a seat at this table and letting the world know that she's entitled to be in that space. Carolyn, could I just jump in and, and add a, a couple of things to what uh, um, was just said by Diana, which was beautifully said. Uh, the, the pressures on being the first, particularly mm. if you're of color and especially if you're a woman, um, and the combination of the two. And, and from my view, in my own experience, there were two types of pressures. So there's pressures from those who do not want to see change, do not want inclusivity, and they're guided by stereotypes. They just make assumptions that you're there for certainly not on merit. And their expectation is that you'll fail, that mm -hmm. you won't be prepared, that you will fail. So there's that pressure. Then there's this other pressure, and that's basically from communities of color that are saying, please don't fail. Mm -hmm. Please do not fail. Because if you do, there won't be somebody looking like you or like us for a long, long time. So you have pressures coming in, pushing on this person who is the first, who's breaking the, the, the ceiling, the glass ceiling here, or the ceiling of color as well, and saying, we expect you to fail, or please don't fail. So there's all of that. And I'm pretty sure, Diane, when you were on the bench and even as DA, you know, there's communities of color, they're supporting you, but they're saying, be prepared, don't, don't mess up. And the other side saying, well, we know you're going to mess up. We expect you to fail. Yeah. Uh, Judge, thank you so much for, for mentioning because, you know, when we break through these ceilings, um, it, you, you've really clearly stated the fact that when we move into these spaces um, and we're breaking these barriers that really challenge the status quo, but also create such high expectations in the communities that we come from, the communities that we represent and that we serve. And, and so it, it really is, can be a very um, challenging time because as you said, there are so many people who expect us to fail because they've already decided in their minds that we don't belong at this table, no matter how qualified we are, no matter you know what path we've taken to get here, there's an assumption that we do not belong at this table and that we don't have the right to be here. And then, as you said, there is the weight of, of, of our community, the, the weight of our people, the weight of all of those who have been disenfranchised and voiceless for so long to really be almost a giant, if you will, in these, in these positions, because we know that it's our whole, our whole community is looking at us and, and cheering for us, cheering for us, but really hoping and praying that we will make a good impression and that we will not only do well here in our positions, but that we will uh, open the door for others to follow not only just open the door, but just kick that dog on door down so we can make sure that other women and other people who look like us are coming through that door. And I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned that pressure, D.A. Beckton, and I'm going to kind of stray from my own script a little bit, and I'm going to move over to Jataka because I know that a lot of what, what you all do with women and with Black women is to be there and be ready, you know, when people are coming against folks' record and really defending them. That's how I've experienced you as, as a baby in this political arena. And, you know, for those who don't know, Women with Black Women is giants across our nation that come together to do that particular work. But can you tell us a little bit more about how you all actually support these Black women, not just as district attorneys, we have Black women mayors who get attacked, we have Black women in our, our assembly districts, all these places that get attacked and need support. How do you all do that in Women with Black Women and why are these collectives so important? Well, to the to the point and and just listening to to Judge Cordell and D.A. Beckton um, in, in your own experience, the what you say and the reality that particularly black women face, uh, not only black women that are running for office or black women that are nominated for, you know, these prestigious positions, but just black women in day to day life are faced with 
what is sexism and racism and microaggressions. And, and when with Black women, and I believe Black women and other Black women-led organizations across the country are, are committed to ensuring that we protect not only uh, the reputation, but the collective image of Black women, because representation matters, uh, in, particularly as it relates to the Supreme Court nomination. We have not even met the nominee, and the right-wing pundits are already uh, discrediting her, already saying that this is affirmative action, already saying that she won't be as good. And it's important for us, it's important for women with Black women to call it out. We have to call it out when we see it. We have to speak out against it. We have to organize against it. And we have to speak out against it no matter where it comes from. Because it doesn't just come from right wing pundits. Sometimes it comes from the media in itself and how the media portray or the stories that they tell or the narrative or the framing uh, in which they tell uh, our stories. Uh, and we've seen it time and time again. We've seen it throughout the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, let's look at what happened to uh, DOJ assistant, uh, assistant DOJ uh, AG Kristen Clark, a highly qualified uh, attorney uh, who just received so much racism and sexism through her confirmation process. What's happening to Dr. Lisa Cook, uh, a, 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 you know, a qualified economist that is up for the Federal Board of, of, of the Federal uh, Reserve Board of Governors. Uh, again, all of these attacks, their dog whistle uh, politics and dog whistle, uh, they're, they're just meant to send a signal uh, to parts of America to reinforce this notion that we are not enough. Uh, when we are the most educated demographic in this country. Uh, and there are so many other great statistics about Black women. We know that we are not only qualified, in most cases, we're overqualified uh, mm -hmm. because of the reality that we've always had to be twice as good to go the same distance as so many others. Uh, and when we have gotten into those rooms, we've gotten into those rooms not because of our sheer qualifications, but because we had to fight harder uh, to get into rooms that we absolutely deserve to be in. And so it's gonna be important, not only through this nomination process, uh, that we as black women and our allies too, because it should not just be black women, but we have to call it out. We have to call the racism out. We have to call the sexism out. Uh, and we have to ensure that not only are we lifting up uh, and celebrating this nominee and her qualifications, but we are also defending and having her back because we know the sexism will come. We know the racism will come. We know the underestimation will come. But what we do know, as we always have as Black women, we have banded together to stand together. Uh, and not only will we make it through, uh, but we will thrive. And I look forward to today that as uh, you know, myself, a, a, a black woman who grew up in, in the South will be able to watch on October 4th, this black woman take a rightful seat in a place that for more than 233 years have been void of the lived experience of a black woman. Yeah. You know, Carolyn, when you were talking, all of you were talking about excellence and how you know we have to be just the, the very best we can be. H history is just really interesting. So when Richard Nixon was president, he nominated G. Harold Carswell to the Supreme Court. And he, so a Senator um, replied to him when he made this nomination. And so he said, even if Carswell were mediocre, there are a lot of mediocre judges and people and lawyers. They're entitled to a little representation, aren't they? And as a result, you know, the nomination was doomed. But can you imagine making a statement saying, well, we need mediocrity on the Supreme Court. That was then, and it didn't kind of go anywhere. And now we have people with these qualified nominees coming along, having an issue. I, I, I can't even, in, in, thinking, in thinking about what you just said, you have the people who have been floated as possible nominees being the cream of the crop. These folks are Harvard or Yale educated, most all of them. Uh, uh, and um, it's not based on merit. It's not based on accomplishment or deep legal experience. It's going to be based on challenging her personhood. We know what that's like because we've all experienced it personally. Massage and noir. It's the very unique way that Black women are discredited for their humanity. You know, I remember in uh, 
2019 and 2020, we assembled a series of listening sessions, not just with black women, but with Latinas and Asian Americans and indigenous women. And um, these are women from the South, like Joteca, and, uh, places like Georgia, Florida, Texas, and also the Midwest. These are battleground states like Michigan and Wisconsin. And we asked them, what are the issues? What do you wanna see? Uh, what are the commitments? What are the promises? And we heard we want a black woman on the Supreme Court, not just from black women, from all of these women. And um, so I want us to realize that, you know, in this country, when you turn on the, the cable news, we might get the impression that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's us against them or it's the people, the book banner, the book people who are trying to ban books are, are gaining in strength. But we have to remember that black women assemble and inspire an inclusive multiracial coalition of people. And it was strong enough to put Biden and Harris in the White House. It was strong enough to win really hotly contested Senate races and, and give the Democrats a majority. And when this amazing Black woman is confirmed, it will be our vice president, who is the 51st vote, a woman of color herself, and we come full circle. And so this uh, nomination process is about us asserting the personhood. It isn't arguing with people who don't see us. It's about assembling those who will fight for and with us for the vision of America that we know can be. We haven't seen it yet. And having someone who can interpret laws in the constitution um, with, uh, with the, uh, the view of a lived experience, and we heard that mentioned before, but also an understanding of, of injustice and the way the injustice has been manifest through race and gender. That's really special. America's so lucky. We are so lucky to have that. And there are millions of people who are with us. And so we have this, uh, this moment um, uh, to bring people together around this nominee it, and, and, to, and to assert our collective personhood and our humanity and, um, and support our leadership and uh, that we should be in that position right now. It's not, no one's doing us a favor. It's because black women have um, collectively and individually um, brought ourselves to the place. And each individual who's being considered for nomination has a, an amazing story of how that she has arrived to be considered for uh, nomination of the Supreme Court. Each woman is going to be judged on her individual merits. Each one is excellent. And it's not just black women who have to bear the weight of this historic and amazing opportunity. It's, it's a a lot of people, every race and gender who are very excited about this. And I can say, I remember when um, Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor was nominated and then confirmed how excited so many people in my, my world were. And it's gonna be that and more um, in this next few months. We're in for a fight, but we're also in for seeing who's gonna have our collective back in, in, this, in this future that she represents for, for the whole country. You all have brought up so many points. I don't know which question to ask next, but I have a million of them. So I'm gonna stick with what Amy said about interpretation. I'm gonna to go to you, Judge Cordell, because in your book, you know, you chronicle a lot of different cases that you've had on the bench, especially juvenile cases. And you talk a bit about how hard it was and how important it was for you to interpret law in a certain way to give equitable outcomes. Can you talk a little bit about, we talk so much about the black lens, the lens of black women, how the conversation changes when black women are at the table. How important it is it to have specifically a black woman, a black woman who's interpreting these laws from the highest court in the land? And how does that change with her lens? Yeah. So the book I wrote was from a trial judge's perspective. And as Judge Becton, now DA Becton knows, um, it's, it's the hardest part is really using discretion where you, you have, you bring in your own life experiences to inform what you're going to do. Let's say it's in the criminal legal system uh, with a person at sentencing and who you are and who that person is. It kind of informs how you will look at those individuals in your courtroom. On the Supreme Court, this is a, this is an appellate court. They're not on the front lines. Here they are having to make decisions about how the law should apply to everyone in this country based upon, in part, their human beings, their own biases, and the people and actions that have influenced their lives. That all comes to be. And that's why I talked about Sandra Day O'Connor learning from Thurgood Marshall about how he sees the world and how to interpret these laws. And that's what the Supreme Court does. It interprets 
laws. And um, what I'm concerned about right now, and it's going to be very interesting to see how this uh, first black woman on the court is going to handle it, is the activism that has now seeming to take hold in the Supreme Court with this supermajority of conservative justices. And activism is usually viewed as a pejorative. It's just not, not a great thing. It means you're disregarding precedent and you're just uh, doing what you think you was right or what you want to do. Um, and that is clearly what's on the agenda as Roe versus Wade comes through. We have precedent. It's quite clear what the law is, but we have indications that we have a court that's going to not go that route. So it'll be very interesting to see how a black woman on the bench, whoever it is going to be, deals with that, that activism um, and is able to perhaps find a way because the, the numbers are not there. The, the, this appointment will not change the conservative majority on the court, but still, they have those conference meetings where they have to discuss things and hopefully maybe uh, it'll be a person who can maybe get through to some of these folks uh, about not being that kind of, uh, of an activist. And I will tell you, there's one other pressure I think is going to be on whoever this person is, um, is seated at the court, and that is the pressure to have restraint when Clarence Thomas opens his mouth mm -hmm. and for this woman not to go off. Because I will tell you, if I, I think now, you know, knowing what I know and everything, if I were to sit on that court, I wouldn't put up with this foolishness. I mean, it would just be, it wouldn't be a good scene. So that's another patience and restraint is going to have to really show forth when they uh, have their conference meetings. You know, I, I hope to be an elected official one day and run for office and I get preached that look at D.A. Beckton looking down like, you know, you got to be good, Carolyn. Watch your mouth, Carolyn. So I, I definitely... <laughs> yes, you do. I definitely understand that. But I, I want to kind of follow up on that again with you, Amy. And we're going to talk to me like as somebody who failed civics. There's always a long-term strategy with these nominations. Of course, we, we're talking about the nomination of a, a Black woman, but, you know, we're talking about age. We're talking about, the, the as Judge Cordell said, the, the majority on the court is not going to change. You know, we're replacing one liberal judge with another liberal judge. What do you see as the strategy going forward with who they're going to pick as far as, like you said, age, views, and all of those things? How does that work when they're um, coming up with a nomination? Yep, you're muted. <laughs> I'm excited about the lifetime appointment opportunity because a lot of things can happen in a lifetime. Remember, even if we're not the majority uh, right now, the dynamic can uh, change and we're, we're in a, a place, talk about activism. When the judge brought up activism, I read the New York Times piece that came out this week that talked about Clarence Thomas pushing the boundaries of right-wing activism and his wife, Jenny, and her uh, being implicated, being uh, connected to and in support of the insurrection last January 6th. That kind of activism has poisoned uh, the court. Now you have a, a, a woman who's going to come into that dynamic and try to establish um, the kind of integrity that we had originally assumed that the Supreme Court justices would have, the sort of um, ability to interpret with life experience, interpret with constitutional expertise, but at the same time, um, uh, uh, really look at those as long-term opportunities to um, pursue justice. The long game is that we have one more seat, one more seat, one more opportunity. Now, remember, when we looked back, we looked back that opportunity during the Obama years, we thought that the president was going to have an opportunity to uh, place one, uh, at least one Supreme Court justice, um, and that was blocked. But our situation can, and the political um, climate continues to evolve. It's very important that we uh, look at this lifetime ap appointment in the whole trajectory of the pursuit to justice. It, and it's one branch of the government. It's one place where we can um, pursue uh, laws and serve, um, you know, have a government that serves the people. And we have to look at it as bigger than one election cycle. I think that's the 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 uh, the the tack that we need to look at is this is a um, this is an appointment that has incredible uh, deck hopefully decades long 
impact. And you, 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 you look at um, the history and you know, the judge could tell you more history where they were. The Thurgood Marshalls placed on a, you know, as a minority opinion on the Supreme Court and the decades worth of influence over time that was built and the whole um, kind of jurisprudence and decisions that were made because he was there. And that's the, I think that's the possibility here. Right. And, and, and just to add in, it's dissents. There are justices who were, say, on the liberal side, but they wrote these fabulous dissents, and those dissents eventually became the opinions of the court. So, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. It's going to take time, which is why we need a, a, a judge, justice there who is young enough to, to outlast these folks there and to give opportunities for more vacancies to open. Can you take me a, a behind the veil just a little bit? I had the opportunity last year, back in 2020, to do the African American Policy Forum with Kimberly Crenshaw, and she ta talked about how important um, we're going to say CRT, ooh, CRT. But you talked about how important law is to that framing of CRT, and she talked about something that was called not her, one of her, one of the um, teachers there, one of the professors, talked about what was called the rules following white man, and I got in trouble about talking about this. In, in Contra Costa County, but the rule of following white men about, you know, how you may not have a liberal court, but at, at times you'll have things like, I believe it was the LGBT workplace equality um, policy that was created by the court where Justice Roberts did actually side on the liberal side because he stuck so close to the interpretation of the law. So can you talk a little bit more, either Judge Cordell or DA Beckton, either one of you, about the, the importance of the actual interpretations and the precedents that are set, even if it's in a dissent, but the precedents that are set when the dissents um, are written. Well, I think Judge, Judge Cordell really touched on, in fact, and, and Amy did as well uh, on, on that subject quite well, but, but I think what we're all saying, because right now, even when um, this new judge goes onto the court, uh, as has already been stated, it's still going to be a court that is very much uh, leaning, not leaning, it is <laughs> in, in the right, right? And it will still be a 6-3 vote. So this is truly the long game. And that's why we need this person to be there, uh, a, a person as has already been stated, that has the stamina and that is young enough to be able to stay for through the long haul, because it's going to be a long haul. But it is the voice that is there. It is the richness of that diversity and that opinion. It's possible that the person could be persuasive enough in those sessions where they're talking about cases and talking about the law and the outcome and bringing this new perspective that is not at the table currently. It's possible that that person could be persuasive. But as we've stated already, those dissents, those dissents can be written in a way that they are so powerful, that they uh, are so impactful, not only on that moment in the court, but also on all of us in the country. And even though at that moment, it may not become the law, it could in the long, long haul, begin to change minds and opinions. And it could have all of us saying, you know, this has got to change and maybe being influential on the future decisions of that court. And remember, this is just one appointment. Hopefully, hopefully, we might even get another one, right? Uh, before uh, the, the dynamics change and before we have this opportunity for the confirmation. And so we can't put all of our hope in this one moment in the sense that there's still gonna be that imbalance, uh, but we're in it for the long haul. And we know that this is a very, very important step towards change. And just to pick up on precedent that you mentioned, Carolyn, the court, issues rulings that all courts in the country have to follow. And the, the importance of these decisions is that they, they set the law, they are the precedent. There's what has to be adhered to. So when those precedents are overturned, sometimes it's a good thing because the court, for example, in Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, stated, ruled that it's the, it was the probably, you know, one of the most worst decisions the courts ever made, separate but equal, but really they met with separate and not equal at all. And so that was just overturned 
1954, with Thurgood Marshall arguing the case, Brown versus Board of Education. So at times precedent changes because the nature of what this nation needs, what's the right thing to do changes. Uh, so you have justices on the conservative side who are not waiting for that at all. It's what they deem that they think is best for the country. Uh, so you have them, what are called that they, they go with just the framers intent, whatever it was the framers intended, that's how we're gonna do it. That's absurd. That's completely absurd. The law changes and evolves just like from Plessy versus Ferguson to Brown versus Board of Education. And then you have Chief Justice Roberts, right? He famously said that his job as a justice on the Supreme Court is to, and I'm quoting him, to call balls and strikes, basically to dispassionately apply the law to the facts before him, and that's it. And then in contrast, during the confirmation hearing of Justice Sotomayor, her detractors just were all over her and attacked her for having once said, and this is a quote from her, personal experiences affect the facts that judges choose to see. That's why it is so important. So you have some saying, oh, it's just balls and strikes and I have no feelings about it. And then you have others on the court say, of course we have to bring in our personal experiences. And of course we have to understand what impact this ruling is going to have on people. So, I mean, that's what makes up the US Supreme Court. And the hope is when they meet in their conference meetings and discuss these cases, at least they're willing to listen to each other. And I don't know that that's really gonna happen now with the supermajority and I, of the conservatives. And it, it frightens me and it saddens me. And as you all pointed out, this is the long game. This is now, and we must not get frustrated. We must not lose, lose faith in this, uh, in this process. And I believe this one appointment in the end is going to make, has the ability to make a big change in the court. It's gonna take time. I wanted to jump in and uh, to that point, um, I had the, 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 the privilege in the earlier part of my career of, of being a strategist around a Supreme Court case, Roper v. Simmons, which was really based on this notion, as judges, you outlined the evolving standards of decency of a maturing society. I'm not a lawyer, um, but I am honored to be with uh, two great uh, attorneys here. Uh, but this, this idea of, of an evolving standard of decency and this the fact that this black woman will sit on the court for a lifetime. Um, and I believe firmly, just as we saw with the abolition of the juvenile death penalty in Roper v. Simmons, um, a case that many thought would never come to fruition uh, with the Supreme Court that we had at the time in 2005. Um, but we saw this idea of this evolving standard of decency that this lifetime appointment has the opportunity to weigh in. Um, and as uh, Dean Danielle Conway so eloquently stated uh, to a group of Black women, the power of the dissent um, and, and, and the importance of setting the record for so many years, for 233 years, we have not had an opportunity or an ability to be on record, whether or not it is our consent or whether or not we are confirming. We have not had the opportunity, but now is our time and we will have that opportunity. The last thing that I would say is, is, is that this appointment also is incredibly important to just the federal bench overall. The pipeline, the fact that we are talking about all of these qualified Black women who for far too long have been underestimated and overlooked and pushed to the margins. And now we are centering them in the conversation. So, so not only is this nominee important, and I want to lift up the words that our vice president uh, stated today, that she will be the first, but certainly not the last. Um, that there will be, after this nomination, I hope more uh, to the US Supreme Court, but certainly I think this opens up a conversation about black women on the federal bench overall. Uh, and we've seen a record number with this administration of President Biden and, and the Biden-Harris administration appointing uh, more black women to the federal bench than we have seen in a combination of previous administrations. And, and I think we're only gonna see more. And I think the fact that we're having this conversation, it is only gonna seed more. And I think 
it's important not only to just the Supreme Court, but I think the overall lifespan of Black women in the judiciary. And I, I have a, a follow-up pipeline question, but first I want to ask a question from the audience, and I'm going to direct this question to you, Amy. Who is the bigger threat to confirming a Black woman for a SCOTUS, a GOP senator or senator's mansion or cinema? Well, what we heard... <laughs> What 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 we heard um, is there's no indication that uh, uh, the Democratic senators uh, from West Virginia and, and Arizona are uh, you know signaling that they won't support the White House's nominee and uh, you know we can't bank on that because of their recent history of blocking really very important policy uh, agendas of the, of the of the White House and and what we've seen come through uh, uh, in terms of. Uh, passing very important legislation, important to Black women, important to women of color. Um, so I understand the question. Um, we also can see there's a, there's at least one nominee who's won uh, Republican uh, support as well in a pretty recent uh, lower court uh, confirmation. So um, I think it's looking uh, pretty good. I think the the Republicans are who to who to focus on. I, I think it wouldn't hurt um, in thinking about where to put your energy uh, to call up the senators. Call, first of all, call your own, own senator, make sure they're solid. That's it, make sure they're solid. Make sure that in um, if they happen to be on the Judiciary Committee, that they're prepared to highlight the qualifications and the integrity uh, and uh, the, uh, the readiness of, of the nominee, first of all, and, and not allow any attacks on her personhood. That's very important. Second, Please call uh, Senators Mansion. Uh, you know, and call the other uh, senators that uh, feel iffy, and make sure that your voice is heard. And third, don't just cede that um, or accept that a Republican will not. There are some Republicans that have supported some of the potential nominees. Call them as well. Let them know that it's very important that they, um, you know, register their support. Uh, for the nominee. I think we don't we don't give an inch. This is not a position of weakness that we come to <laughs> nomination as a position of strength. And let's act like it. Let's let people know that uh, black, black women are a uh, electoral force. We're an organizing force. We're a moral force in this country. And we motivate a broader coalition of people. And so let us use the power that we have in order to um, uh, uh, you know, make sure that these senators do uh, do what they need to and support and vote for uh, this nominee. Now I have to reword my next question because you already led into it a little bit, Amy. <laughs> and it's, it's the conversation about the pipeline. And, you know, that's one thing they were saying in political spaces everywhere. Build the bench, build the bench, build the bench. But as I said, I'm again a person who's just now paying attention to how a SCOTUS nomination works. I mean, because as we say, representation, I haven't paid attention since Clarence Thomas and really all I remember in 1992 as a seventh grader was the Anita Hill hearings. So then you have that. So, but I do know that now as an adult out in these spaces, when we talk about elected justice positions, like being a district attorney, like being a sheriff, I've talked to friends who are qualified for those positions, especially sheriffs, and you cannot get Black folks to really be interested in like these type of appointed and elected positions. How do we embark on, I'm going to start with you, it because I know you have to leave us in a little bit. How do we start to get Black folks to understand how important it is for us to not just become lawyers, even though we need Black lawyers, but really start getting in line for these appointments? I know, Judge Cordell, you first came to the bench as an appointment. How do we build a bench of justice warriors that get up to that federal level? I think it's important that we recognize and understand the power and the importance of being in these positions. Let's take a look at, you know, a case that we all were watching uh, the last few weeks and the last two years in, in Ahmaud Arbery uh, and the brutal murder that took place uh, of, of, of Ahmaud Arbery. Uh, in that case, it was a district attorney who failed to do her job in prosecuting the murders of, of Ahmaud Arbery. Um, imagine if there was a justice-minded uh, district attorney 
that was in place in this county that has a very large population of African Americans in Georgia. Uh, imagine if that we had a justice minded district attorney there. I believe that we would have had a much different outcome that we would have sought justice uh, much earlier than we have seen come some two years later. I, I would also look at and, and, and just remind people of the, the remarkable public service of our vice president who started her career um, as a district attorney, as an attorney general, is now a US Senator and now the vice president of the United States. It is important for us to be on all sides of the law because having that lived experience, having that uh, knowledge uh, is incredibly important. I think we shouldn't shy away from being in these positions because it is often those key positions are the positions uh, that really is an indication of, and, a, and a line between justice and not having justice. And, and sadly for our community, for our community, uh, when there is a lack of, of justice, it's often at the hands of a decision maker uh, who does not look like us, but has power um, and is often elected into office in communities where we have a majority or where we have the ability to sway and to have a, an incredible impact on who is elected into that position. Yeah, but, but, but you know, one reason why we don't have, as Carolyn pointed out, so many people of color and particularly black folks running for these positions, and Diane, you can support this, I'm sure, is that running for election is hard. It takes money, it takes time, you have to have an organization, and that's running for sheriff, DA, or if you're running for a judgeship. Uh, I've also run here, down here in Palo Alto for the city council. I did get elected, but it's not easy stuff. So it means it, it's just really hard. And that's why I think you're finding people who are we've just wonderful doing public service are not doing it because they don't want to get into this craziness with the elections and social media that can distort anything you say, put it out on Twitter, and then then you have to go you know, deal with that. So this is really hard. And I, I don't know what the answer is uh, because it's all about money and it's about you know, getting the support you need, which takes a lot of time. You ran for a DA, man. I mean, that was huge. It, it, you're so right, um, Judge Cordell, that it, it really, first of all, it takes a whole lot of courage and it takes a really building, putting together an ama a team. Uh, it puts, takes, um, getting a lot of support. It takes having the longest days that you can ever imagine, you know, from being somewhere at seven in the morning for breakfast and then being somewhere at eight o'clock at night for something else. And, and then really being able to raise the money, especially, you, you know, it, for myself, like in a countywide or in a statewide position, uh, it takes a lot. But I want to just take a, a kind of a step back, if you will, for just a minute, because and Carolyn, I be making that. I don't want you to lose that thought, but I know that Jataka has to leave us real quick. Oh. I wanted to thank her for, for her amazing perspective, amazing. joining us and, you know, follow when, where, where can people fo follow when with Black women, Jataka? Uh, you can find Win With Black Women on all social platforms. So you can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Instagram. We're on Clubhouse. There's a Win With Black Women conversation uh, that happens every Tuesday at 8 p.m. We're also on Twitter spaces and we are going to be activating and, and, and really mobilizing in coalition uh, with the collective of Black women leaders uh, and organizations to lend our individual and our collective voices to this very important moment in history in not only making sure that we call for the full fair confirmation of the nation's first Black woman Supreme Court justice, but also making sure that we protect her and that this process is free and void of sexism and racism. And I look forward to celebrating the day that she takes her seat on the bench of the US Supreme Court. Yes. Thank you, Jataka. We'll see you very soon. Thank you. All right. DA Beckton, I hope you didn't lose your train of thought. Go ahead. No, I just, because you had mentioned earlier about building the pipeline. And, you know, I think that pipeline has to start earlier and earlier and earlier, you know, not waiting until we get to the place where we are thinking about possibly running for office, but starting so much earlier, either even with our kids, you know, in, in, in elementary school, if you are high school, getting them not only being able to see us, 
and, and see people who look like them in positions of influence and power, but also telling our stories so that they understand that they too can, can, can get here, right? So I know that when I was doing uh, work um, I used to chair the State Bar Council on Access and Fairness, and that is, was a huge part of our work. And one year we decided to bring a group of high school students from a, what we would call an underserved community to the court to spend a day with judges and lawyers and everybody who worked in the courthouse. And we had them just write a brief snippet before they came. Like, wh what are you looking forward to? What do you wanna see? What do you wanna hear? And the kids just had these really dismal stories. Like, I don't even know why I'm going. I never been, met anybody that went to college. I don't have any money. I don't, I don't know why, you know, we have to go on this kind of trip. And then after they spent the time with us and they, they understand that we came from the same communities that, that they uh, came from, that we are still in those same communities. They hear our stories about how we were able to get into college, how we financed our way, worked our way, how all of those things happened for us, even though we not, did not necessarily have the support. Their exit paragraph was one of empowerment. It was like, wow. I, I met somebody today who looks like me. I can see myself in that space. And so I, I'm just trying to make the point that, that all of us have that responsibility, right? To, to try to help not only um, build a pipeline, but to see for young people to see us in these positions and feel empowered to understand that they can be in these positions too. And then of course, the, the huge, huge significance of being a mentor to people who reach out to us, who are thinking about doing something like we're doing, being able to take the time with them to help them understand how to navigate, how to become a judge, for example, is a lot of work that those who've been in, uh, who've been in the judiciary, we spend a lot of time in those kinds of spaces, helping people, people who look like us, people of color, to understand how to navigate those spaces and how to get into those positions. And so I just wanted to mention the importance of that pipeline and how early we really have to start so that our kids can grow up with the understanding that, um, they they can be in the same positions that we're in. Yeah, because remember what Supreme Court uh, Justice Sonia Sotomayor told a 10 year old in 2020, you know, as yeah. the first Latina on the Supreme Court, you know, you know, you can be anything. And mm -hmm. she said, I want to be the next Latina on the Supreme Court. And she was 10. That's the power of having a lifetime appointment that a black woman could have on a whole generation or generations of um, black girls and women uh, considering going to law school, considering running for DA or running or being appointed, pursuing a, an appointment as, as judge, going on the district court or state courts and working their way up so that they can then be considered um, in the future for Supreme Court appointments. And I think that's amazing. Um, you know, I just wanted to say, Carolyn, and um, She the People um, is a national network. There are women who are running for uh, positions like DA. Um, one percent. The DA fact is like part of a one percent. Very, very special uh, group of district attorneys. But um, there's a, a black woman running in Sacramento uh, for district attorney. There, there are women who are running who require our focus uh, and and our support and our attention um, so that they don't have to feel like they're doing it alone. And I think um, for those of us who are are part of changing this landscape, uh, we know that it's going to be important that the criminal justice system, that the court system reflects who lives in this, who actually lives in this country. And it's about time black women have our rightful place um, uh, in, in these roles. I'm muted. Since we're wrapping up, Amy, how can people find you and She the People to follow your work? She the People's on Instagram, uh, Facebook, and Twitter, and shethepeople.org. Thank you so much, Dinah Becton, District Attorney Dinah Becton, my District Attorney Dinah Becton. How can people find you to follow and support you? Oh, you're muted too. <laughs> it had to happen once, huh? Uh, DinahBecton.com, D-I-A-N-A-B-E-C-T-O-N.com. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Judge Cordell, how can people find you and follow you and tell you that they are reading your book like me? <laughs> All right. Yes. Wait, I got my way home. You got here. your book. There we go. There we go. Um, I'm on Twitter at Judge Cordell. 
And uh, my website is www.judgecordell.com. Thank you so much. I want to thank Judge Lodoris Cordell, District Attorney Donna Beckton, She the People's Amy Allison, and Jateka Eddy from um, Win with Black Women for joining me for this amazing, important conversation. I feel like we just got started. I hate that our shows are only an hour, but I hope that you and the community have enjoyed the show. Um, please continue to have the conversation on our Commonwealth Club Facebook page, on our YouTube. Um, and if you are interested in the conversations that we're having, make sure that you become a member because we do these conversations all the time. Once again, my name is Carolyn Weisinger. I am the education coordinator here at the Commonwealth Club. And this adjourns this meeting of the Commonwealth Club. Have a great evening. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.